It's really smart, but just sit down. They oh, figure I'll just walk yeah. off the podium, yeah. grab it, and, and go. head down okay. the aisle to so my next. Thingy. Hello, Linda. Okay, looks like we're ready to go. Thanks everybody for attending today um, and welcome to uh, this session um, into the new frontier instant cross-border payments. So I um, want to welcome everyone. Um, my name is Courtney Trimble. I lead our global and U.S. payments practice at KPMG. Um, and, you know, we have an exciting discussion today with um, our esteemed panelists, you know, across the banks, the infrastructure, and the, uh, the official sector. So, looking forward to it. I'll let everyone introduce themselves, and then we'll get, we'll get going. Hampton. Hi, everyone. I'm Hampton Feiner. Uh, I'm the head of uh, payments and market infrastructure policy at the New York Fed. Hi, Beth Geller, J.P. Morgan Industry Issues Team. Hi, I'm Hayes Littlejohn, CEO of EBA Clearing, which for those who don't know us, is a similar organization to TCH, uh, responsible for clearing and settling euros. And I'm Matt Luce, I'm in the strategy organization at SWIFT. Okay, to start off with, uh, with, with from a cross-border standpoint, um, just kind of st setting the stage, um, let's start talking uh, through, you know, what's driving the need and demand for cross-border payments. Um, kind of kick it off from a, from a wholesale banking perspective, you know, cross borders are still pretty traditional and costly. Um, um, from, a, from a standardization standpoint, an ISO 2022, that will certainly um, evolve and um, with respect to interoperability have, uh, have, have a big play there in the next few years. Um, there are certainly opportunities um, from a cross border payment standpoint, um, helping lower transaction costs, you know, if payments arrive instantly, you know, it removes the clearing agents from the mix and then also, you know, potentially widens the, the perimeter of trade, uh, make, you know, making it easier for cross-border. Um, I'll ask the group, um, let's, let's talk through what you believe is, is driving the need for, for cross-border payments, uh, immediate cross-border payments. Hampton, start off with you. Yeah, I, I mean, I think there's, the, the, there are both the, the supply and demand factors. I think the supply factors are sort of straightforward because, you know, the technology, you know, I think the technology is, is, is really evolved to the point where it's relatively inexpensive um, to, to develop some of these systems. Um, I don't think it's inexpensive to operate them, but I think it's, you know, a lot of the technology is there. I mean, on the demand side, I think we see a bunch of different factors. I mean, the, the, the settlement cycles are shortening. Um, I, I think we have a, a, just a general expectation these days that things happen right away, and I, I think that carries through um, to, to retail. Re, you know, to, to retail payments and also um, to wholesale payments. I mean, globalization, I mean, the march kind of continues. There might have been a little bit of a hiccup, um, you know, per, perhaps over the last several years for one reason or another. But, um, and, and obviously there are kind of significant pockets which, which, which are, have been deglobalized, as we all know. But I, I, I do think that globalization will continue and, and, and the pace of, of, of growth and trade is going gonna, is gonna to continue to expand. The, the dollar shows no... Uh, indication that it is going to uh, not just continue to become more and more significant and important. So when I talk, when I think about cross-border payments, I don't only think about cross-currency payments or, um, you know, ones where there's a currency translation step, but really do think about cross-border dollar payments. And I, I think, if anything, um, the, the events in the last six months have really um, reinfor reinforced um, that trend. Uh, and, and, and there really is no viable substitute, notwithstanding, um, you know, Hayes, Hayes' outfit. But I, you know, I think the, do the dollar will continue to, to strengthen and, and, and across borders. Great. Hayes, let's get your perspective on this. Thanks. Um, yeah, well, I might disagree with you on the, on the strength <laughs> of the dollar uh, <laughs> for a lot of reasons. Um, but um, I think that uh, it still plays a very important role. And um, I think when we're talking about uh, the, the need for cross-border payments, a lot of those, those, those um, things have been hit by um, Hampton. But I think um, there are other things out there. I, I think about this in terms of accelerators and brakes. And so the accelerators that are out there are things like the competitive pressure from tech companies or non-banking financial institutions, 
that are hitting most of the people in this room or people are participating in them in some way. There are initiatives from the um, BIS, um, including the Financial Stability Board, um, and the G20 to try to make cross-border payments cheaper, faster, better, and, and uh, all of that. There's all the de-risking, which I think is also impacting the, the dollar ar around the world, but um, uh, will also drive demand for, for more cross-border services. And I think there's, the, you mentioned the technology, and that's absolutely right. And I think the technology is out there to do things a lot faster. And I think, uh, you know, I can imagine a world where um, the, uh, there's an evolving need for account-based services mm -hmm. to, um, to replace transactions that today might go over card or even crypto or even other places and be done in a fully compliant way. Um, a lot needs to happen there. It's a bit of a vision, not a hallucination. But um, I think it's a, a good opportunity for the industry to get together and work together to make that kind of thing happen. Great. All very good points. Uh, Matt, from a, from a SWIFT standpoint, um, what, are you, what are you saying? I mean, to me, I kind of simplify it into the client expectation continues to, to change. Right? Clients are, uh, all of us in this room, many of us maybe probably don't do personal cross-border transactions, but I have the opportunity to live overseas and, and do some cross-border Right, that simplicity, cost, and ease of doing things is being driven from the consumer end. Obviously, we probably all have a smartphone in this room. We're all using it for a variety of purposes, including making transactions and payments on a daily basis. Whether I'm always amazed now, I don't need a Metro card anymore. I can just tap in to the subway system here. But then you take that up and look at treasurers, and as you go into the corporate space, you know, we've been talking about this probably, I've been in the business for too long, for many years, but it's actually starting to happen where you're seeing the younger treasurer generation having expectations of what they can do from their consumer life and their personal life in their business life. And we're gonna see a lot more pressure of that. I also agree, right, the, the growth in trade and the growth in cross-border is gonna continue to, to keep happening, but we have this big client expectation that a cross-border transaction is just as simple and as easy as a domestic transaction and cost-wise uh, the same or similar. And we'll get into later, of course, why that's not as easily said as, as it is to do. Um, but to me, it's those client expectations. Great. And Beth, from a, uh, from a bank perspective. Yeah. Um, so first, I just have to start out by saying the opinions I express are my own, <laughs> not those of uh, JP Morgan. Um, but I want to, you know, kind of echo what everyone else said. You know, Matt, you said we've been talking about this for years. The ECB just put out a paper that says the holy grail of cross-border payments has been looked for for a thousand years, and now in the next 10, we're going to get there, right? So we've talked about the technology, the changes there, um, how that can help deliver. The challenges have existed, you know, maybe not for thousands of years, but for a long time with cross-border payments, we definitely are at a point where the technology is enabling us to realize some change finally that can help um, deliver what clients are looking for. We're seeing a number of different players taking advantage. We have fintechs, we have CBDC, we have crypto. Um, everyone is competing to try to solve this problem, looking at how we can meet the best needs, meet the demand and meet the needs of our customers. So um, it's an exciting <coughs> time to see how this is going to play out. Definitely, definitely. You know, on that topic, um, you know, what efforts are underway to enable cross-border payments and what do you imagine that experience to be over the next two to three years? I'll just kind of kick it off from a, I think, um, from an ISO 20022 standpoint, that's going to be a game changer, I think, globally, right? I think we thought through that, we all agree, you know, rather than those proprietary formats country to country, that standardized XML, you know, cross-border will really be able to simplify, streamline, and standardize things. So. You know, we're seeing, you know, 80% of, of total transactions and 90% of account value, you know, moving uh, from a high value tra transaction standpoint uh, to ISO over the next four years. So really a game changer. And um, first of all, interested to, to understand the, Matt, from your standpoint, um, uh, from your SWIFT hat, um, how does that um, impact and what do you see there? Yeah, I mean, to me, ISO is kind of the foundation to be able to do a lot more with the data, structure it better, do things, connect things better together, make interoperability simpler and easier. But it's just that, and we're very early days. We'll go live later this year, but that's just the beginning of it. It's gonna take many years for the market to get fully ISO and get fully compliant. 
you know, creating standards is very critical in that space because there's different forms of ISO. But then as I look at beyond ISO, what's next or what have we done at SWIFT, I start with GPI. GPI to me was another foundational change in the industry. It was something that was probably overdue, bringing full transparency to a transaction and looking at that end to end and making sure you have that transparency. And now how do we bring that further and how do we expand upon GPI? I look at a lot of different initiatives and really to me it's about moving things, what I call left in the transaction. How do we move things up? Because we talk about truly getting to instant cross border, which is a challenge. How do we move things left? How do we do things earlier in the process? So by the times they get into the infrastructure, there's gonna be no issues and there's gonna be no friction. And that's really what we're focused at at SWIFT. How do we get instant and frictionless? How do we do this in new ways? Obviously, traditionally from the cross-border space, we've used messaging. I don't think messaging is going to go away anytime soon, but we're gonna have different options of how we do things and how we interconnect. We've been doing experiments in CBDCs and looking at gateways to help with that interconnectivity. You know, I know Hayes will talk about a project that's very near and dear to my heart in SWIFT with IXB mm -hmm. and how we bring, right, the clearinghouse and EBA together to connect two instant payment systems. So to me, it's about moving things left, doing things in different ways, leveraging what Beth talked about, leveraging about that technology. And to me, you know, that ECB report was very interesting because the headline was the holy grail and some misinterpreted it that that was CBDC. But if you actually read the paper, it actually listed about 20 things that need to be occur and none of it really related to CBDC. And we're gonna get into later around compliance and other challenges that bring friction to the market that can't be solved just with technology. And so to me, I see two to three years as we keep, we're gonna get faster, we're gonna get better, we're gonna continue improving on the edges where we see most of the challenges and then come up with new and better ways to do things without throwing away some of the good things that exist today. Great. Hampton, from a from a Fed standpoint, where are you seeing things moving? Yeah, I mean, yeah, I, I, th I think Hayes, you know, Hayes mentioned the G20 FSB work that's been going on on cross border payments. Um, you know, that, that we are we are kind of getting into the next stage of that work, which you could call implementation. Um, you know, I don't don't construe that similarly. I'm talking from my own perspective, not from the Feds today. But the, you know, the the, you know, I, I think that there's a lot of exciting things going on. Uh, Interlinking of faster payment systems was definitely mentioned, and I think that the project um, that Matt cited is, is you know is, a, is an you know is an interesting one. But you know, and, and in addition, I think that's going to be an area of focus for lots of jurisdictions. Um, you know, the extent to which you know how it how it works in the U.S. I think really remains to be seen. I chair um, what was called the payment versus payment works you know the payment versus payment building block, but that really uh, we solicited um, sort of expressions. Uh, it was what was called a request for ideas. Um, and got a ton of, of interesting um, proposals around um, increasing the use of payment versus payment, but also, but many of them really were dealing with instant payments um, and, and you know, not sort of your tr traditional CLS wholesale settlement kind of model. Um, they really spanned um, and constituted sort of these multilateral, uh, you know, multilateral payment systems. In, and, and I think there's just an explosion of interest, lots of different models, some, you know, just kind of working with banks some in a more centralized um, infrastructure model with a central bank account or something of that nature. Um, it, th th there is a lot of interest. I think there's a lot of facilitating work around ISO and um, you know, other types of harmonization efforts which, will, which, which, will, which are also um, gonna be incredibly important and not um, really as glamorous as you know, a new and shiny you know, piece of technology. But there's really um, you know, an incredible interest in this space. Um, maybe there always has been, but I think we were very surprised at how much interest there was, um, a, a, you know, especially in the sort of settlement aspects, which sort of people have a hard time wrapping their brain around the importance of. But it, it, it's very, very, um, it's, you know, just explosive growth in ideas. Right. Beth, from a bank standpoint, um, how, how are you seeing things? Right. So from the bank standpoint, you know, there are going to be um, initiatives in the industry with the market infrastructures and then the bank is going to implement them and make them available to our clients. We're also going to have our own products that we make available to our clients um, to help solve some of these problems. But, you know, really we have to be looking at the future and what kind of options clients need. When do they need to make payments? Where do they need to make payments? How do all of these initiatives in the industry fit their needs, um, we're going to be, you know, of course, participating in the SWIFT initiatives, in um, IXB, in um, the program 
uh, the cross-border roadmap. So, you know, this is all intended um, to give us different solutions to help our customers really get to the goals of the program, right? The faster, cheaper, more transparent, uh, more accessible cross-border payments. So um, there's, there's a lot going on. I think, you know, the first iteration of this will be, you know, in these, say, like next two years, and then you'll see as we get closer to the five or maybe the 10 in the ECB where it all lands. But, you know, this is the beginning of the journey, um, and there'll be evolution over that time. Definitely evolution of this, and you know, Hayes, you you, you brought up IXD um, and in your participation in that as well. If you'll tell us uh, about that initiative and yeah, everything going on there. Thanks, Courtney. Yeah, just a quick show of hands. How many of you actually have an idea what IXD is? Show of hands. Ah, excellent. Very good. It's good to see Russ's hand in the back. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Russ. Um, yeah, so IXB in a nutshell is an exciting project that we're working together with the Clearinghouse on uh, where we've come up with this idea of interlinking uh, the clearing systems of the two most important currencies of the world, the euro and the US dollar, the most turnover, um, as, an, as a pattern that we can replicate in, in other corridors. So it's, a, it's a, a starting with a bilateral linking. And the um, special concept there that we came up with is synchronized settlement. So in a, in a typical clearing system, you have atomic settlement. As soon as something goes, it's clear, it's final. We needed to be able to do that cross-border, and so we came up with a, a way to do that, leveraging the investments that we, that you and we have all made in the industry over the last years, including real-time payment systems and uh, messaging and the availability of these systems 24-7 and the availability of the, um, the ISO format. Um, so th these things have all come together into a design that we're calling immediate cross-border, so IXB is what um, it uh, is abbreviated as. And um, we um, are able to link it together also with a lot of the, the tools from SWIFT, including uh, GPI, um, pre-validation, and eventually some of the other tools that SWIFT have to offer in a global context. And um, the idea is to go um, live with, with this, um, hopefully before year end with our, our, um, our minimum viable service. That will be just to get it running with a few transactions. Um, and then in the course of 2023 to gradually and successively roll it out further. Um, and even expanding into other currency corridors. And there's a, a number of currencies that um, have come and, and knocked on the door and said that they're very interested. So we're, um, we're also pursuing talks with, with those currency corridors at the same time uh, at that. And I think if you put this into in terms of a vision of the next two to five years, and you combine it with other things like request for payment or request to pay as we call it in Europe, um, I think you end up with a value proposition cross border that can be really um, complementary and additive to what's already out there, uh, not only correspondent banking, which is working pretty well, but if you're able to, you, over IXB, settle under a minute uh, cross-border and know that that transaction is done, and if we can bring that down to a, a few seconds, then you can imagine a world where actually you could do a transaction, a commercial transaction, uh, purchasing something with e-commerce or at point of sale. And this is a bit further on, but it all becomes possible, and the idea that uh, connecting that with our, t our uh, request for payment and or uh, fraud tools that we might be able to put in the middle could make uh, the world be faster and less risky at the same time. So that's kind of my vision of this evolving world of, uh, of account-based services. Great. Thanks, Hayes. So we've talked about the, la the next uh, two to five years. So what factors do you believe will influence, you know, how cross-border payments evolve? Um, I, you know, if, as you look at the rules and regulations, these currently vary by jurisdictions. Um, if you look at, you know, governance, there's no real governance body globally, so we'll need to, uh, that will need to continue to evolve as well as we look across uh, different jurisdictions. I think that'll be important as well. And I think, you know, looking at very much a stepped approach around this, I think will be key. Um, you know, logical trading partners, regional nuances, you, th you look at the, the Nordics and, and P27, that, that's kind of one example of, you know, natural trading partners, cross-currency, and uh, that regional flavor, you know, as a stepped approach. If, if we could talk through, you know, other factors, roadmap items, you know, operating models. Um, Hampton, I'll start with you, just in terms of your, your thoughts there. Yeah, I, I know this, I don't, I don't want to steal anyone's thunder from the other sessions here, but I mean, I think, you know, account access is on the tip of everyone's tongue. Yeah. I, you know, I, I think how we define the regulatory perimeter um, and, 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 and to what extent um, 
you know, that, that, that sort of expands to slightly different models and non-traditional <coughs> players, I think will, will have a big effect. I mean, whether, whether it's desirable or not, will you know, leave for, for a different debate. But, you know, I, I think that there, many of the models out there are, look to having some sort of access to central bank money. Um, you know, traditionally that has been, um, you know, restricted to, to, to the depository institutions for the most part. Um, you know, if, if, if it is extended to payment systems, including sort of stable coins or other tokenized systems, you know, that will have a huge, um, you know, a, a huge effect. Uh, or or, or account-based systems. I, you know, I, I don't think there's anything all that magic about tokens um, here. Um, but, but I think that that, to me, is going to be a very, um, you know, key factor in, in, the, in the development of some of, you know, some, some of these systems. I, I kind of think that the account-based systems are going to, continue to kind of seize, seize the day. Um, you know, I, I sort of assume that to be the case as the, as, as the sort of demand pressures increase. But um, on the sort of supply side, I mean, are these non-traditional outfits um, going to, um, you know, enter into um, polite company, so to speak, and, um, you know, and, and perhaps in exchange or in, a, in addition, um, you know, get, get access to central bank services. I, you know, that, that to me is, will, will be a, a real factor and, and very interesting to watch. Interesting. Um, Beth, from a from a bank standpoint, looking at the different operating models that you need to consider, what does that look like? Yeah, absolutely. So there's really a lot to consider, right, when you think about immediate cross-border payments, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year. Um, what are the operating models that you need to work in the bank? How is sanctions going to work? How is fraud going to work? How are repairs going to work? What about FX? What about liquidity, right? There are a lot of factors outside of the technology um, that have to be built into these solutions. Um, and those answers aren't always, um, you know, right there. Look at the geopolitical p situation, changes that have happened this year that is definitely going to influence how these things um, are worked out. At the same time, being able to move money on the weekends is helpful in uncertain geopo geopolitical situations, right? So you can absolutely see why um, that would be beneficial. Then you have to look at challenges like staffing, and it's a challenge for staffing in regular hours. Even if you are, have a follow the sun model, how do you then also look at some of these weekend hours, holiday hours, off hours, right? So all of this has to be kind of considered, changed, re-engineered, right? Outside of the technology that has to all be looked at and really built into the beginning of the solution. Um, and then you have to think about like, how does it work between the client and the bank when something goes wrong, right? You know, that's not just during regular hours, but during off hours, all of these things. Um, had a call with a client recently that wanted to understand more about some of the U.S. initiatives for 24-7 and could they opt out of them because they don't work on the weekends and mm -hmm. they don't want to have to staff on the weekends and reconcile on the weekends and deal with issues on the weekend. Can they keep everything within the regular hours? So everyone is going to be changing at a different pace. Some people will really gravitate towards the more immediate. Others will want to stay with the models that they're used to. And so, you know, the operating model is really something that's going to need a lot of deep discussion in order for this to be um, a smooth process, right? We talk about the kind of smooth and frictionless money movement, but we also need everything else that surrounds that to be smooth and frictionless as well. Yeah, huge operating model yeah. implications. Hayes? So uh, um, following on, on, on Beth's comments, I, I think that's really important to, to realize. And I think the other point is um, in a lot of speeches of uh, policymakers and, and uh, G20, FSB, you hear this cry for everything has to be instant, instant's the new normal. Uh, and to your point, uh, it, yeah, for some things it is, and for some things it's not. Mm -hmm. And it's not a solution for everything. And I think you have to respect people's desire to lead normal lives and not have to work 24-7 if they don't want to. Um, and then, so I think that's an important point you make there. I think, you know, this is for, for me, when, when I talk about accelerators and brakes, this is a bit the brakes part. Um, you know, despite the, um, the holy grail and, you know, a lady of a lake is not going to give you a sword that's going to solve all the problems. Um, the, the, the problems that, that we solve in a technical way um, are not the hardest ones. So, you know, IXP is, 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 is clever and creative. CBDC is clever and creative. Crypto is clever and creative, and they all have certain applications. 
Um, but the technology actually is getting relatively easy to do. Mm. The hard part is that soft bit in the middle, uh, and some of it you talked about as well, Beth, which is the compliance, which is being able to, to have actually a level playing field with some of these other uh, fintechs and cards that actually are able to benefit from the 24 by 7 and how, because they've actually had a head start, but they've also come at it from a different way. And as we're coming at, at global payments from a kind of correspondent banking way, the traditional way of having to, um, uh, to screen every payment and do sanction, sanction screening, fraud checking, AML compliance, all the stuff that you have to do when a payment's domesticated, that hasn't gone away. And those kinds of things are gonna have to be um, more automated, faster, maybe using tools that, that allow that to happen in order for us to have a level playing field. But I think there's a role for the public sector here. And the, the, um, the G20 initiative and the FSB paper that came out a couple of years ago in, indicates all of these frictions. There's a lot of activity on the technical ones, but not so much on the tough parts like uh, global compliance. And I think that uh, having a common definition that we could apply across borders that would allow us to create a kind of safe harbor and more efficient processing of, uh, of compliance transactions or of sanction screening would be a huge help to the industry. And mm -hmm. I think that's something where the public and the private sector should be working in concert to get it done. Yeah, great point. Matt. Yeah, I mean, I think piggybacking on <coughs> Hayes's comments, you know, technology can take us so far and technology has done a lot to enhance cross-border transactions. Let's be honest, banking in general, you can argue our lives in general, although some may argue our lives really better being on call on our devices 24 seven, maybe not, but that's the world we live in and that's the expectation that's out there. But in the, in the global cross-border payment space, tech can only take us too far. Yes, can AI and machine learning, which machine learning we've been using for decades in the payment space, AI is obviously an enhancement of that in many ways. Can that help in some spaces? Yes. Will it solve the sanctions issue end to end? No. Right, and that's the challenge that, you know, Hayes, I wholly agree with you. The biggest challenge we have is we can do everything technically, we can solve all those problems, but actually when you go cross border, no matter what, you've got two different jurisdictions, two different central banks, two different governments mm -hmm. who have different priorities, and that's okay. Look, the world's shrinking. Apparently we have a pretty big geopolitical situation happening <laughs> in the world that's causing one thing that's very consistent in my mind in the payments industry, which is before we get to more concise, we're going to have a time of fragmentation. It's already started, it's begun. We've all referenced all the buzzwords of some of that fragmentation that started, whether it's CBDCs, crypto, stable coins, right? You can say what you like about crypto. I'm a believer, it's not going away. It's not going to just end tomorrow, right? People are seeing it as obviously an investment tool, a very speculative one but it exists, it brings capabilities from a cross-border perspective when you look at it that solve some of these issues because it has no real jurisdiction, but then the reality is that doesn't work for financial institutions and others, right? You can't just have something where you don't know who the parties are, right? You don't know what the transaction's for, right? So there's some real reality that we need to get into here. And so that collaboration and working together, right? Reemphasizing projects like IXB, right? And where SWIFT is played traditionally, we, I just see SWIFT, you know, our global goal and where we've had success is that economic interoperability. And that definitely isn't going away. We've done it in many different ways with correspondent banking and with messaging. Like I mentioned earlier, that will exist in some form or fashion for a while. It may start declining as we look at new technical ways to do this better and more efficiently. And as we try to pick up the speed of transactions. I mean, you've got a transaction settling in five seconds on one end in the five seconds on the other end, and then you have a compliance hit, it just doesn't, you know, one plus one doesn't equal two at that point. Mm -hmm. You've got a challenge, it's not a simple challenge to solve, and we just need to keep working together to solve it, but I think that's the exciting part, is, you know, we're working together, we have been traditionally, I think the payments industry, in my mind, is just a great example of that collaboration and cooperation to get to where we are today, and that's just gonna need to continue at a pace and in different ways from a compliance perspective to make it really happen. How do you truly get instant in this world where there are so many things that can go wrong once you enter the cross-border spectrum? And your requirements from a bank, financial institution, wh whatever role you're playing, right, are much harder in the cross-border space than they are in a domestic. Yeah, all great points. Uh, uh, you know, key points here, you know, 
certainly need some guardrails. I mean, we're looking at this. Um, technology is not the issue. Technology is there. Uh, it's all about that synchronization and standardization from an operating model standpoint, compliance, governance, and looking across it that way. Okay. Um, so final remarks from folks. Um, we've covered a lot. Um, Hampton, do you want to start? Yeah, I mean, I, you know, I think I think there it, it is imperative that we you know sort of tackle these frictions. I mean, that that, that was in the roadmap mm -hmm. and, and and what have you. And I think there's there's going to I like the the I agree that there's going to be some fragmentation. I think we will coalesce around some some solutions. You know, we had 14 submissions for our our you know our our request for ideas, and we were very clear to one another that not all of them are going to be successful. And I think we have to, um, but but that doesn't mean that we don't let them sort of try. Um, I, I think this is especially true with some of these, you know, th these newer technologies. But I, I have to say, I mean, I'm quite anxious about some of the models which really separate, um, you know, which, which take, you know, separate sort of issuance, um, you know, from the transfer mechanism, and and you know, we end up, um, you know, it, it you know, I, th I think having payments on the public internet is is something that we're really going to have to think hard about how we're going to uh, live with. I, I I don't know that people have really absorbed how radical an idea. Um, that really is. There's a tremendous amount of opportunity, but there's a lot of risk um, from a payment integrity perspective, and I think I'm hearing a lot of that right now. And to me, that's something that bears a lot of uh, a, a lot of watching, and and um, will take a lot of thinking um, over the next several years in in the official sector, but but I think also in the private sector. Yeah, agreed, agreed. Hayes, your perspective? Yeah, um, challenging years ahead. There's a lot on the on the. Uh, on the table, a lot for banks to focus on, and also for the industry at large. I think, um, th you know, the money that you have to put in it is, is one thing, but getting the, the also the qualified resource that has the understanding of what uh, what these things are and how they're moving, and can also do um, things with the new technology is really uh, it's going to be a challenge going forward as well for the industry. And I think um, that what we will see though is a coalescing of these different activities. Uh, I think the other danger though that we need to to highlight is uh, sometimes there are competing initiatives and we have this, this there's an expression in Germany you can't dance at all the weddings <laughs> and it's it's true you have to pick which which weddings you're going to go to and and invest in and I think that um, that that's important as well and when it, when we look at what uh, what I see I think that's the space that I would say in a cross-border point is really interesting to watch and there'll be similar initiatives around probably I think the central banks are also cooking something up that might be of interest, but um, I, I think the, the capability that that opens um, for product uh, development, for risk control, um, is we're just at the beginning of understanding what that is when we enable it. Um, and I think there are use cases out there that um, today are happening in, in other ways or not happening, and these things will suddenly become um, much more visible as you put out a tool and people figure out how to use it. And so I think, uh, you know, watch, watch the space of IXB. The other one I'd say to, to, to pay attention to is the request for payment, request to pay. Um, I think this has enormous potential, not only domestically, but also globally. And if we interlink those, we can do quite a lot with, uh, with new products. Uh, we can drive also customers back to their, their bank interface. And I think the, the last point is when we talk about um, access to payment systems, which I'll give a little plug for the next one, um, is, is it's really important that with, we've heard a lot from different people about same rules, uh, you know, same system, same business, same rules. Um, and I think it's time that everybody puts their money where their mouth is and, and not just say that, but actually do it. And uh, when you give access to, to non-bank financial institutions or others to, to payment systems, really consider what risks need to be nailed down because of that and what that risk that introduce and, uh, and make sure that they're covered off. So that's kind of my view. Great points. Yeah. Matt? Yeah, and I think Hampton, right, you, you kind of touched on, right, there's this new world out there that I'm probably not as familiar with as some of the younger generation, but this Web3, this whole theory that everything kind of be owned in the public and this DeFi decentralization of things, when we start looking at it from a financial perspective, very quickly we start questioning a lot of how is that going to work, you know, how's it going to be secure, how's it going to be safe. You know, I always use the example in, in the payments world kind of comparing it to, to cell phones and you know how far we've come in that technology. But the reality what is and still and was back in the day, if you lose a telephone call, you get disconnected, which is pretty rare these days that we're even on the phone. But let's imagine you're in a world where you're still talking on the phone to somebody. 
and you get disconnected, you're not happy, but you just call them back and all's, all's fine. In the payment space, if you're sending a payment to somebody and you don't know where it is and it, or it gets lost, uh, depending on the size of that payment, you might start stressing pretty quickly. And so <laughs> we've always got to remind ourselves, but let's be honest, right? Obviously our health and our family and all of that is top priority. Most likely number two priority is the security of your finances and your cash and your money, whether it's personal, whether that's your treasurer, whether that's your bank, right? And so the safety and security of the environment is going to be critical. Technology will help, but you know, we've got to work together to do that in the right way. And I think some of these technologies that you know, allow for things to happen in different ways could be very interesting. I also think you could see a backlash at some point, right, as there's that security issue, fraud, and other things that become rampant in some of these new models and some of these new markets. So we've got to be very careful how we kind of proceed. But I'm extremely excited, right? I think, you know, echoing on Hayes with the IXP program, right, there is a lot going on in this industry. It's a great time to be in the industry. And look, there's going to be a lot of change, uh, but I think we're ready for that change. I think the community's ready for the change. And, you know, at Swift, we're really excited about how do we get to that instant frictionless and how do we create that interoperability, even if that fragmentation may be short-lived, right, as things then coalesce to the, the, the winners versus the losers, right? But for a period of time here, we're gonna have, you know, an exciting time and there's a lot to do. Right, yeah, absolutely. Beth, run it out from a bank standpoint. Yeah, I mean, so there absolutely is a lot to do at this time. And, you know, we think about these linkages and the value that they would bring. We also want to talk about, like, what is the role of the banks? What is the value of the intermediary? How do the banks link up the systems, the countries, the other banks, right? So, you know, we can talk about technology and how certain things are made easier, but that doesn't give um, any... Um, relief on some of the legal and regulatory challenges and how does a bank in one country participate in a faster payment system in another country it's linked to. So how can an intermediary help that? How can an intermediary make FX available, make liquidity available so that you're not having to have liquidity in all of these different countries? All of these roles that have been historically uh, correspondent bank roles, intermediary bank roles still very much have an important value in the new system. And that's really something that we're going to continue to see the banks play a role in, right? As well as, of course, how do we prevent fraud? Um, so, you know, there are lots of models that are intended to make things easier, but we really need all of the right pieces in place, the banks, the market infrastructure, the public sector, in order to deliver on that um, for the clients who need these payments. Right. Certainly evolving, certainly a lot of initiatives in place, and certainly will be a stepped approach as we move to, uh, to interoperability and cross-border. Um, so we do have a few minutes um, for questions. I haven't seen any come through the, the chat. Actually, there are a couple here. Um, do f the first question here, do fair lending concerns so algorithms, et cetera, significant re significantly reduce the value of fintechs in the pure lending space. Any perspectives? Not sure what it has to do yeah. with cross-border per se. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, I think it's a good example of that technology, whether it's AI, right? You can't just have AI do things and not know why it did something. So yeah. it may make your life much more efficient operationally right, compliance-wise, but uh, let's be honest, right, the regulators aren't going to accept, um, I gave Hayes that loan versus Beth that loan because AI told me to, right? You're going to have to make sure you can, uh, you know, have explainable technology, and AI is a big part of that, which I think comes into that question, which is, yeah, the technology can take you so far, and we have the same challenge in the sanction screening example where you may have let a transaction go through <coughs> using artificial intelligence. You're going to need to be able to explain why that happened. And so, you know, you see a lot of technology in that space focused on, you know, simple explanations of very complicated decisions that computers are making. And as quantum computing, no expert in this, but as that becomes more mainstream, <laughs> which I'm being told it will, right, as more and more people get trained on it and it becomes the new norm, things are going to get faster and better. And so these computers are only going yeah. to, you know, overcomplicate this, this market in some way. 
And, and I think from the sanctions perspective, right, as it's more about not just the name on the list, but the purpose of the payment, the why of the payment, right, that's going to really be something that has to be answered, not just by artificial intelligence. So that's, you know, something that we have to be looking at as well. I, I was saying before, if you can make a payment on, on the public internet, you can make a loan on the public internet. And, you know, I think there is this, this idea that anybody can lend to anyone else and, um, you know, I, I think from the functional regulation of fair lending and the like, I mean, that's a huge challenge yeah. to be able to, you know, to, to, and, and it goes back to the level playing field idea. I mean, you know, you can't have folks, um, you know, operating, you know, outside of, you know, our established expectations, norms, um, you know, and, and, and honestly law. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, I think that is a, a, a consequence of that level of decentralization uh, without a doubt, and I, which we don't have answers for right now. Um, we've, we've relied on the banking system and, and the regulated banking system to do that for us, and if that's no longer the case, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure um, you know, where that marketplace goes. Certainly an evolution. Uh, one more question here, um, also around AI. My AI question is essentially one around the regulatory clarity. Yeah, it, I think this is around the same. Um, but from a regulatory clarity in the markets, and for example, you can't solicit demographic data outside of, the, of mortgage, soon small business, and wouldn't that be helpful for consumer credit? So we've hit on the, the AI component. Any additional thoughts there? All right, what questions from the, uh, from the audience? Anyone have a question? I guess my question is um, for Beth, you know, when you're thinking about RTP internationally, you've got local governments that need to be okay with this, right? And so you're moving from a situation today which is multi-day to instant. How do you think they get okay with that? Is part of the solution even more liquidity held by you know, the correspondent banks or whomever the intermediaries are in this process. If there's a different solution, that would be great to hear too, but I kind of, you know, my mind goes there as the solution. So yeah. tell me where I'm wrong. No, I, I think you're right about that. I think that, you know, there's different schemes throughout the world and that, you know, we're going to be seeing a few years of experiments and how do these linkages work and does liquidity um, need to be in all of these different places and will the correspondent banks be, you know, who's providing that? So I think that that's really something that is going to be, um, you know, as, as it's encouraged to link the systems, we have to have these models very quickly developed that will work for the majority of them or some that work in the larger corridors and then there'll be different models in some of the small corridors. Um, that you know will work better for some of those corridors. So I think um, that we don't have necessarily the full picture yet of how that's going to work. But um, as we look at initiatives like IXB and how that might work in a large corridor, we'll very quickly get towards um, something that we can then evolve towards other currencies, and then there may be some other um, ways we look at different markets. Yeah, I just add on to that. I think that. Um, IXB will give us a lot of, of, of experience. And one of the things that, that, that becomes useful here is being able to leverage liquidity that's already in RTP or RT1 um, for uh, this purpose as well. And if you're able to channel transactions in both, in both directions um, in, into those systems, then you get a reciprocal flows and matching liquidity. And so you can actually make it more efficient. And if you combine that with uh, some other things that we, we have done in RT1, and I'm sure exist in, in other systems that are uh, doing instant payments. Uh, we have uh, liquidity analysis tools that help the users um, understand how liquidity is being used around the clock and help them then automate and, and um, uh, make that task easier so that actually the treasurers can, can take care of debt using um, uh, automation tools, for example. And so important in a rising rate environment, right, yeah, is absolutely. that efficient use of the liquidity. It's going to be you know, a new challenge of this that we haven't seen in years, but it's aligned to yeah, the initiative. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think that's a challenge as well, especially yeah. in some of the RTP systems that 
aren't really actually open on the weekends, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and the banks are required to put up collateral to process those with those volumes. And I think at the UK, especially when they have four-day weekends, where actually, let's be realistic, most of the transactions are consumer. So actually, the volume's up yeah. on these holiday weekends. Yeah, it's going to be costly. So the model's going to have to change. Yeah. And I, I think if we have, I mean, pre-funded systems are rising. I mean, if we have a fragmented pre-funded systems, you're going to have trap liquidity. Yeah. Trip yeah. Liquidity is getting more expensive. And again, that will shake out someday. But you know, there could be a period of, um, of strain. OK. We are unfortunately. Tim, do we have up time for one time. more question or no? Do we have time for one more question? Yeah. Okay. Tim okay. Mills. Quick question. Um, so, so you know, we're talking about the functional movement of funds cross border. Thinking more about what is the impact or the implication for domestic payments, and I'm thinking more specifically around compliance um, regimes, right? So, if you think about here in the U.S. today, that the way that we're treating real time payments is really like we treat other domestic um, payment um, rails, but as we open up international or cross-border capabilities, what does that do to the way that the regulators look at domestic payments from a compliance standpoint? Think OFAC, AML, BSA. I, I, I mean, I, th I think you know, when, when you hear about harmonization, I don't think anybody's talking about a race to the top. Um, to be really clear, they're, they're, they're really talking about harmonizing down, and, right. and, and I, I don't think that the U.S. wants that to happen, to be really honest with you, and yeah. so, um, or at least, you know, we're not going to act unilaterally, and, and you know, so it, it takes two to tango here, and, um, you know, but I, I think the U.S. is going to continue to, to demand an incredibly rigorous um, compliance process that all of the institutions that are involved in the payment system, I do not see that, uh, I don't see that getting walked back. I, I think, again, you know, the, the, the dollar is so important and so vital that I, I don't know that, it, that, we, that we're going to feel it as a, domestic, as a domestic payment system, but I, it will certainly make those corridors, uh, you know, the, the international corridors more difficult, um, with the exception of Europe and you know, places where we're pretty harmonized already. So. Okay, great. So thanks, everyone, for your time. Thank you to the panelists. Great conversation. Everyone enjoy the rest of the conference.